In this session, we travel back in time to the early 20th century, really the first few decades of the early 20th century, and the historic avant-garde. So we focus mainly on futurism, on uh, the Russian avant-garde and its relationship to the October Revolution of 1917, and, and Dada in, in, in France, in Paris. But what I'm going to do is try to coordinate or sync up these, these movements, which we're going to see open towards participatory practices as we're studying them this semester, and, and link it up to one of the most famous texts and one of the most celebrated texts from, from this period, or actually a little bit after this period in 1934, which is Walter Benjamin's author as producer. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus mainly on this text and see some of the ways in which its ideas uh, hook up to and, hark and, and, and sort of help us understand or work with these participatory strategies that we see in the historic avant-garde. So very quickly, we could start just chronologically uh, with, with the, the, the futurists and futurism. I mean, 1909 is an important date because this is when Marinetti publishes uh, his Futurist Manifesto in a number of different newspapers, actually, throughout, um, th throughout Europe, but most famously Le Figaro, which is really an, an incredible feat to have uh, an avant-garde art practice, in this, in, in, at first a poet, uh, poetry, um, being published in such a, such a major newspaper. And so there's a lot to talk about with futurism and participation, which we will when we get together. So the serratas, but also the concerts, um, and even, as you're going to see, just sort of fighting in the streets. Um, but this, the, the act of publishing a manifesto through the newspaper, through mass production, is really important for, uh, for our purposes in understanding Walter Benjamin's idea, uh, idea as an author, as producer, though this is very important. He would, he, he would say that the futurists um, incline towards the wrong political tendency, and we're, we're going to talk about that more. But the fact that, a, that, a, that a, a group of artists engaged with the public directly through mass media is an important first step in understanding and sort of tracing the history of participatory art. And the newspaper is going to be very interesting uh, and very important for us. It's very important for Benjamin, as you'll see. Um, um, as we move forward. The other, and maybe I would say probably the most important, um, in some ways the most interesting, but certainly at the level of scale, the, the, the largest, would be the, the, the mass spectacles that came right after the Re Russian Revolution. So 1918, they did, if, if I remember correctly, the first mass, mass spectacle uh, was on the anniversary of 1917 of the October Revolution. And they did a few um, every year after that, up into the, the early the early 1920s. And this is really just an, an incredible um, um, an incredible moment. These are some incredible works to study, where it really is engaging with the whole public. So this is this is truly one of the first participatory arts where the public, everyday people, um, who are at this point trying to build a new state, a new communist state, after really fresh after, fresh after the, the revolution, they're all part and uh, active in, in the work. So these are going to be important to trace. Ideolog ideologically uh, 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 opposite in many ways to the, the futurists who will, who will go down the fascist path. And then we have Dada. Um, uh, so this is just this is right right around the same time. Dada in Paris, engaging the public though on a smaller scale, and with with an with a, um, a, an ideology that I think is is harder to to, to pinpoint, um, and the politics are harder to pinpoint as they usually are with Dada. Though it's safe to say they're anti-capitalist and they're anti-war, um, but this is one of the one of the proto-participatory works that, that's associated with Dada, the excursion to Saint-Julien-le-Pauvre, which might be the first artwork uh, that, that takes the guise of a, of a tour. Um, and since, there have been many, many, uh, many, many artists who, who, who use the tour as a performance format for art. So this might be one of the first one, one of the first ones. And so with futurism, with the, the Russian avant-garde, 
coming coming off the, the heels of the October Revolution, and in fact before the October Revolution, where you have the constructivists and the productivists who already are trying to do away with traditional notions of, of art in order to engage the public uh, more actively uh, and sort of break the barrier between art, art, artist work and audience. Um, um, and, and Dada. So these are, these, are, these are the three that Claire Bishop traces in our chapter for this week. And we're going to find all sorts of wonderful information and ideas in there in order to, to sort of understand the, the, the origins of participatory art. Um, and many of these, these ideas, um, especially on the, on the side of the Russian, uh, the, the Russian avant-garde, resonate really loudly and really nicely with this very famous and very celebrated text by Walter Benjamin, author as producer. Offering up some context will be important and helpful for, for uh, tackling this essay. And the first, I suppose, um, has to do with where it was given um, and, and, of course, when it was given. Um, so this would be the, the historical context. So it was presented, though it's still, I think, debated or unclear whether he really actually, uh, uh, he wrote it for, for this venue, but whether or not it was actually delivered, I think it's still debated, but we don't really need to, to go into that. Um, at the uh, L'Institut pour l'étude du fascisme, or the, the Institute of the Study for, of, of Fascism, in 1934 uh, in, in, in Paris. And so this is really important to, to point out because we want to situate this writing uh, not only in relationship to the, to the Russian re Revolution, which of course happened much earlier in 1917, and we should keep in mind that by 1934, we're already well into um, the, the, the Stalinist regime um, and the, the dream of the revolution turning into, um, turning into something of a nightmare, um, which has a lot of implications for culture and for artists, uh, which Benjamin is not completely aware of yet, um, at least in this, in, in, in this, this, this text. Um, so that's, we have the benefit of hindsight there historically. Uh, but more immediately, understanding this relationship between the Institute for the Study of Fascism and this date 1934 is important because you'll likely know that in 1933, uh, the, well before then, the, the Nazis, the National Socialist Party in, in Germany had been gaining power, and in 1933, Hitler becomes chancellor. So already the, the French, especially the French left, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of anxiety and worry that fascism is going to start moving um, and making incursions into, into France, which of course eventually happens um, later on, in, in uh, actually very soon hereafter, in the late 1930s, and then we have World War II and the cataclysm that, that is World War, War II. Um, and Benjamin will, will ultimately actually you know, have to flee uh, France and will 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 die because of, of, of these developments. So, this history hangs in the background of 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 the text. So not only the course of the Russian Revolution, but also its ideological opposite, the the, the onset of fascism in Germany and its spread over the course of the 30s uh, and in 19 in 1940s. The other context that's important is I, I, maybe just more limited to the cultural context or the debates that were going on at the time, the aesthetic debates, which encompassed uh, writing and, uh, and, and art making. Um, um, so the, the cultural context this year is important. There were, there were debates about the role um, and the efficacy of, of the intellectual. Um, and again, in this, in this case, we're talking about both writers and, and, and visual artists, so cultural producers, along with playwrights and filmmakers and so on and so forth. Um, so th this essay, its central question, or it's one, of, one of the central purposes of this, of this essay, is to, tr is to try um, to articulate the, the best role and efficacy for the, for the intellectual in the class, in the class struggle. And in this case, um, uh, once more, we have to we have to invoke the October Revolution and its aftermath because the um, the artists and the writers that that are part of the legacy of the, of the Russian Revolution, um, so Tatlin, 
uh, Malevich, but especially uh, Rajen Rachenko and Stepanova and Lizitsky, um, along with other, along those are the visual artists, but along with with, with poets um, and writers, one of which we're going to talk about in a moment. They already provided Benjamin um, a source of influence or, or of a model, because all of these artists that I've just mentioned, as they were forming and trying to envision a new future, um, post post a post revolutionary future for the Soviet, for for the Soviet state, um, it was an increasing endeavor or or an increasing drive to taking art production and hooking it up with. The, with the proletariat, with the working class, um, and with the, the, the actual production of, of, the, of this new state. Uh, so when we get to productivism, uh, artists are, 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 are not painting anymore. They're not, they're not uh, doing anything um, that would be established within a traditional, what they would consider a bourgeois uh, medium, but they'd actually be trying to make things uh, work in factories actually contribute to the the revolution itself and and the the, the, the the productive aspects of the revolution. So this is this is a very important influence on on Benjamin. Um, though again, the irony here is that by 1934, these experimental constructivist productivist works, many of these artists have they're, they're no longer welcome to say the least. And there's a there's a reactionary line in Stalinism um, and, and a, an embrace, an enforcement of socialist realist work, so painting works of art that are, that are uh, more traditional, um, mimetic, representational, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that's in the backdrop. But then there's also something that goes much further back because it may be perplexing to, to, to start this essay and then be greeted with a classical philosopher, one of the, one of the major classical philosophers, of ancient Greece, which is Plato. So the reason he starts this way is because he's hearkening back to this very famous passage in Book Ten of the Republic, one of the most famous, one of the most um, well-known dialogues of Plato, where Socrates, over the course of building his ideal state, which is related, which we, we can see how that's related to the Russian Revolution, he says that the poets, um, and I guess we can we can think of it more broadly as artists, because he does talk about uh, painters, um, they should be banned from the state uh, because they're too, they're too seductive, and above all, they, they're not, uh, for, for Plato, they're not really tapped into reality and truth. They live in a world of, of illusion. Um, and so it's this very famous moment where he bans the poets. And this then gets us to the question, which is also a central question for this text, is that of autonomy, artistic autonomy. Uh, so by autonomy, I mean the idea that uh, the artist is free to create uh, and to produce as she wishes um, above and beyond political or social forces. Um, so it's clear that in the Russian Revolution um, and in Plato's banning of the poets, artistic autonomy is not what, what's sought after. Um, what's sought after, we're going to talk about this at the end today, is heteronomy. So the idea that art is actually connected to life, connected to politics, and in some ways has to be subversive and in the, in the, in the pursuit of, of social and political, uh, political goals. Okay? So this is why he starts out with with Plato, and I just wanted to, I wanted to situate it for you um, within the context of the, the Russian Revolution. And in fact, it's very interesting to read Plato's Republic and study the the, the October Revolution. Um, it's a very interesting thing to do. Then there's a third part of the cultural context, which is uh, which are, which had to do with debates that were happening largely in, in Germany, but elsewhere. Um, the debates over expressionism, um, um, another early uh, movement of the historic avant-garde in Germany, um, uh, and, and the de debates between, I think we can just say, between form and content, um, especially modernist experimental form and political content, which, which, uh, um, uh, which in, in Germany at the time would be 
on the, on, on the left. Ar many Ar Arabs would be on the left, and then they'd be defeated by the National Socialists. Um, so this th this plays out in very very well known debates and correspondence between Ernst Bloch, uh, Ernst Bloch, and and, and Lukács. Um, so B Bloch championed modernist form and experimentation, and Lu Lukács uh, championed content and and, and realism. Um, and so we're going to see that this this division or this binary between form creative form and content, uh, you know, a political message um, and political commitment, it, it, it continues to inform the social and cultural space of the time of author as producer, and it actually continues to inform um, um, cultural moments since. And so how does Benjamin approach this? This is, this is the key uh, pivot sort of theoretical kernel um, and move that Benjamin makes in this essay, and this is actually the hardest, the hardest um, part of his essay, for a number of reasons, I think. Uh, and one, I think one reason is because some of the terms that he uses are both no longer they don't they don't have the meaning uh, that they did then. They have a slightly different meaning today, but more consequentially, oftentimes I get the sense that some of these words have m many meanings, many possible meanings. Uh, and Benjamin doesn't really take the time to unpack them and to be very focused and specific as to how he's using these words. He actually moves rather quickly through, through, through this argument. So what is this argument? Well, it can be uh, stated in such a way that it, it pitted tendency versus quality. And here, here we are right off the bat. We want to understand how he's using these terms um, and how they link up to previous uh, debates. By tendency, or you'll, some, you'll sometimes read it as tendentious, we're talking about commitment. Um, he'll also call it political correctness. And don't think that this has today's connotations. Um, it has nothing to do with political correctness as it's using today, as it's being used today. Um, it's the idea that one is has the has the right politics. So of course, in this context, it's to be of the left and on the side of the proletariat and the working class and the class struggle. Um, so this has to do with uh, tendency is more related to, in some ways, um, the, the content of, of the work, of any one work, whether it's a novel, whether it's a, a, a painting or what have you, or a film. What, what needs to be privileged, what has to come to the fore, is its political commitment. Okay, That's what he means by tendency. Whereas quality, um, that's a little more easy to understand, which will also, this gets confusing, but he also talks about it as literariness. Um, here we're talking about the, about the form, about the aesthetic dimension of, of the work of art, of the novel, of the, um, of the painting, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you can see how this graphs onto and matches the debate between form and, and content that I just spoke of that had to do with the, the, the more or less contemporaneous, contemporaneous debates on expressionism. Um, and... Benjamin is completely and utterly dissatisfied with, with this binary, um, and maybe we should be too uh, today, which is something we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But he really wants to get past this division, um, which he says at, at one point in, in the text, this is a quote, uh, he says, it's a debate whose familiar, familiarity tells you how unfruitful it has been, for it's not advanced beyond the monotonous reiteration of arguments for and against. So he's describing this 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 cultural landscape of people just one one group is on one side, the other group is on the other side, and they're they're, they're arguing and it's endless. Um, and so what what does he do? Well, this is where this is where things get rather that rather tricky, and we have to understand that Benjamin he's at the head of the Frankfurt School, at the head of critical critical theory. Um, which is a conglomerate of a number of things, but above all, they're Marxist. They're Marxist theoreticians. Um, and the move that they like to make um, is, is called dialectical, which means you put two things in, in, in conversation um, um, with, with each other, and you end up with a new term. Um, so this actually goes back to Hegel, um, a, 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 one of the most important uh, German philosophers, um, who described this this dialectic um, um, as synthesis as thesis uh, antithesis and then you put those together and you have synthesis. Uh, 
Um, so two terms that are opposed to each other, but if you, if, you, if you fold them into each other, you then get a new term and you resolve that, that log jam between those, those two terms. Um, this Hegel called sublation. You sublate the terms, and this is not exact, but this is how I describe. This is why I describe it as sort of folding them together in, in order to get to a new term, in order to get past the impasse. So there's like a there's there's a there's a, a forward moving momentum to this dialectic. Hegel was an idealist, though, so he he, he argued that that um, the way these the way these things get uh, play out, um, they play out at the level of ideas, and this is how history moves for Hegel. Um, this is what he called spirit. Um, so this dialectic throughout spirit um, is, is an idealist one. It's one at the level of ideas. Marx comes along, greatly influenced by Hegel, but disagrees with the idea that, that history unfolds uh, at the level of, of ideas. He says, yes, we do have thesis, antithesis, and then we can move beyond, beyond their tension towards a, towards a synthesis. Uh, but he says... They don't happen at the level of ideas. They, le they happen at the level of production. They happen at, at the level of classes, of the way society actually um, exists um, in a materialist sense. It's the material of history. The workers, the owners, the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, the modes of production. It's the, it's the tensions between that, between, between those components of, of society and, and the political that drives history forward. So if you ever see the term dialectical materialism, that's, that's, that's what Marx is talking about, okay? And this is important to lay out to understand Benjamin because Benjamin is a dialectical materialist, okay? He doesn't want to talk about these terms, tendency and quality, just at the level of ideas. He wants, he wants the critique um, and his synthesizing of these terms to function and to hook onto the material plane of social and political existence, okay? Um, and so how does he fold these terms together? This is where things get really tricky, um, and I've read this essay so, a number of number of times, and I'm never completely satisfied. It could be my own shortcoming, uh, my own shortcomings, but, but I'm never completely satisfied in the way he lays out this argument. But essentially he says that Tendency and quality uh, are 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 connected together. They're 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 the same. Um, uh, and there's a quote on page seven seventy six where where you know he flat out states this. He says, "I'd like to show you that the tendency of a literary work, its political commitment, um, can be political cor politically correct only if it all if it all if it's also literarily correct. So uh, a polit a, a politically um, uh, committed work of art that has the right tendency only has that right tendency if it also has the right quality, the right aesthetic quality. So this is what we mean by, by sublation, by folding these terms together. He, he, he fuses them together uh, and, to, and tries to show that they're in fact um, um, one synthetic uh, thing. And this synthesis leads him to a third term, which is literary tendency, um, which is tied to literary technique. So, you, so as, as, as we're reading this passage, and this is in set page 776 is where it's at its thickest, um, all these terms, which are not arcane terms, um, they, they, they start to look repetitious and we start to miss the subtle differences between one and the next and how he's moving and how he's um, uh, working out his, his theory. Um, and so by, by literary tendency, which is related to uh, literary technique, um, he's describing the, the, the creative technique, but also its material condition, also like the technique of its production. So not only the form of, of the writing, but also how the writing is printed, where it's produced, how it's disseminated, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so you can see for him this, this synthesis between tendency, political commitment, and quality, the form, the aesthetic form, collapse and, and generate a new term uh, where both work in tandem, uh, where both are, are, are threaded together in order to, to leave us with this idea of literary tendency and literary technique in which the creative aspect and the material aspect are, are inseparable 
from each other. Okay, this is very important. We're going to come back to this idea at the end uh, of, 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 this, of this lecture where we bring in some examples that hopefully will make it more clear how these things are, are commingled, how they're inseparable for each other, and how Benjamin thinks he's resolved this loggerheads, this, this, um, this um, dead-end binary between tendency and, and, and quality. Um, and this is, this is also crucial here. He says that literary technique um, can be either regressive, so it'll use older forms of production, um, older media, uh, like painting, like sculpture, like the bourgeois novel, which I think all of which you would argue cannot really be engaged, truly engaged with the class struggle. Um, or they can be progressive. Um, like photography and film, and you're going to see in this essay, specifically the newspaper as a format, is, is really important. And so he says it right there on page 776. The, the correct quote, this is the quote, the correct political tendency of a work thus includes its literary quality because it includes its literary tendency. So for him, political commitment and form are, are fused. Whether or not he argue, argues this uh, to your fullest satisfaction, I'll leave that up to you, uh, but I hope it's clear what he's trying to do here, the type of move he's making as a dialectical materialist. So let's get a little more concrete and move away from the more abstract aspects of all this and get to some of the examples and the influences that he, that he cites, and that certainly had an influence on, on his writing and his theorization. Um, and the first would be Sergei, uh, Sergei Tret, um, uh, Tretyakov, um, who's, a, who's part of the Russian, Russian Revolution. He's, he's a Russian writer um, trying to articulate, trying to uh, conceive of a, of a form of intellectual, a form of writer who will be um, engaged with the class struggle and this building of a new state. Um, and the important term for Tretyakov that, that Benjamin picks up, picks up is the operative writer. So you'll see this in the text. He talks about this a couple po at a couple points. Operative writer. Well, what does he mean by operative writer? Um, operative, I think, can in some ways be uh, linked to producer, um, someone who's actually uh, producing and engaged with uh, the, the working class and the proletariat. So the operative writer for Tretyakov is in opposition to a journalist who's detached or a writer who's detached, like a bourgeois novel um, like that, that, that only reflects reality but actually doesn't intervene in reality, um, as opposed to, to that type of detached intellectual the operative writer is a, is, is a writer who's actually embedded in the class struggle. So Tretyakov's life is an example of this, right? Um, you, 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 Benjamin will talk about the ways in which he actually went and worked on communes. He actually organized uh, uh, with, with, with uh, farmers and with, uh, with communities. Um, he embedded himself and, and on, on a material, in a material sense, this is a materialism is really important here. In a material se sense, um, organized and worked with the social and political conditions as part of his his writing, right? So this harkens back to a really famous quote by Marx, uh, the Eleventh Thesis, his Eleventh Thesis, where he says. Uh, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. This sentiment of not simply interpreting or reflecting reality, but, but going in and changing reality, uh, that's, the, that's the big ambition for someone like Tretyakov, um, for a lot of the, the, the Russian revolutionary artists and writers, and of course, for Benjamin himself. So it's clear that Tretyakov and his conception of the operative writer is very important for Benjamin's articulation of the author as producer. Um, and Benjamin is also influenced by the Soviet newspaper, or what he, what he conceives to be the Soviet press, um, which is related to this, the, the operative writer. Uh, Benjamin believes strongly that the older genres of writing and art making are in a moment of crisis and they're going to dissolve, and they're going to move towards, towards modes of creativity and modes of engagement um, again, this, this marrying of quality and tendency 
um, this literary technique, they're going to they're going to move towards new formats. Um, and the format that he privileges above all else in, in this text, anyways, is is the newspaper. Um, and he says this is on page seven seventy two. For through the press, at any rate through the Soviet press, because of course for him um, the, the press in Western Europe, in France and Berlin, are owned by capitalists, and so they, they're not part of the class struggle. Um, one realizes that the mighty process of recasting that I spoke of earlier, we're going to get to this idea of recasting in a moment, affects the conventional distinction between genres, between writer and poet, between scholar and popularizer, but also revives even the distinction between author and reader. So what, is the, what does this all mean in the context of the newspaper? Well, one, the newspaper jumbles up all these different specialties, right? Jumbles up all these different um, um, stories. So the division between genres is breaking down. Um, the, a poet or an intellectual can write in the newspaper, right? So it's not, he's not relegated to writing in, in lofty philo philosophical treatises or, or novels, uh, but is actually engaged in the newspaper, which is more accessible to everybody. Again, through the material conditions of, of printing um, and dissemination. Uh, but also, the, the distinction between author and reader is really important here. Um, because the newspaper, arguably, someone who's reading a newspaper is more engaged and has more autonomy over even just like the order of how they read it. Uh, whereas like a, a novel, like if you read Tolstoy, don't start just <laughs> jumping around in War and Peace. Like you kind of have to read it. In the designated way, so it's more active of of, of the author uh, of of the reader, um, and of course the reader can write in the newspaper, right? Uh, can 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 write um, um, letters to the newspaper. These letters can be published, and so on and so forth. So for Benjamin, the newspaper represents this paradigm of engagement and a breaking down of these of these boundaries between genres, between. Uh, between um, the, the artist and the public, and even the, the very distinction between author and, and, and reader, okay? So this is important to keep in mind. So who are the enemies for uh, uh, Benjamin? Um, of course, the, the, the ultimate enemy is fascism, right? Um, the, the ultimate is enemy is fascism, uh, but also the rapacious, craven capitalist class and, and, and the bourgeoisie. Those are the enemies. But what about the enemies from within the left? These are the enemies he takes, up, he takes uh, on directly in this text. It's a very confrontational text, actually. Um, it's a very confrontational text. And so who are, who are these enemies? Well, he talks about two movements. Uh, one is a movement called activism, which is less well known. And he, um, he impugns the, 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 the intellectuals that, that, that consolidate themselves around this movement as intellectuals that only reside beside the proletariat and beside the, cra the, the class struggle, um, almost like as um, uh, you know, like a fellow traveler standing outside but not really getting their hands dirty. And he says very uh, upfront, uh, very directly on page seven seventy three, what kind of place is this to be beside? Well, that of a, be a benefactor, of an ideological patron, an impossible place. So for him to think of the intellectual as a fellow traveler, as beside the class struggle, is untenable. Um, and it's certainly not materialist. It's not actually getting in uh, and, 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 helping sh and, and helping to shape society in concrete terms. The other movement that he impugns uh, is, is a movement that's both um, uh, a literary movement but also a, a, a visual movement, um, is Neusaklischkeit, or it's, it's called translated as New Objectivity. These were artists and writers who were, were taking um, a frank and sober look. They were, this is where the term comes from. They were trying to be objective about reality um, and to represent it in, in, in as sober terms as, as, as possible, including um, the, the onset of mechanization, the onset of industry, of, of modernity and poverty and injustice and inequality. So they're on the, they're on the left, right? They're the, you'd think that they were... Um, uh, that they would be championed by, by someone like Benjamin, but he, he's, he's pretty scathing. Um, he, it all boils down to the fact that he thinks, he argues, that they've made uh, an aestheticization of poverty and of injustice. He says, again, on page 776, Neusaklischkeit, the objectivity, has made the struggle against poverty an object of consumption. 
Um, and his major example is probably one of the most well-known Neusaklisch guide photographers, Albert Renger Potsch, uh, who, I mean, they, these are really beautiful photographs of, um, of, of industry and, uh, uh, and, of, uh, and, and tools. So there's something, there is, it does hook up to uh, society and, and production and, and workers but it does it in such a way where the, the beauty of, of the photographs are exactly the problem for Benjamin. Uh, they've been reduced to aestheticization. They don't actually show social relations. They don't actually show exploitation. Um, and they seem to be standing outside. Worse, they, they might be supplying a form of beauty and enjoyment and, uh, and a consumption of, of poverty. Um, so you kind of like, you, 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 you get to be engaged with uh, social issues, but you also get to enjoy the, the uh, beauty and, and, and art and so on and so forth. Um, so for Benjamin, this is this also is is is, is not materialist. Um, it's a, it's probably a form of disavowal and a form of escape for him. Okay. And so all this brings us to, I would say, the major influence for Benjamin at this time, which would be the playwright George uh, Brecht. And so this is the second example uh, of, of Benjamin's author as producer. The first was Tretyakov. This is the second example and influence, which is, which is uh, Georges Blecht. And there's a term that he gets from Blecht, and he cites it directly in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the essay, um, um or refunctioning or functional transformation. This is an important term for Benjamin and for Brecht. Uh, and he, he describes it as having two separate steps, um, how one uh, refunctions um, or, or uses functional transformation. Or you remember that quote I read just a little moment ago of recasting. Recasting is also maybe an interesting way of, of translating this word, um, uh, which um, um, I'm told my German isn't good enough, but I'm told I've read that this is a difficult word to, to translate. Um, so we're working with when we say refunctioning, we're, we're just think of it as someone as inexact. But there are two steps for Benjamin. And so the first is for intellectuals, writers, artists, authors, um, to acknowledge their own proletarianization with respect to the modes of, of production that distribute their work. So this sounds like fancy, but basically it's about knowing how does your own writing or artwork, um, um, how has that been... Um, subordinated within what he calls an apparatus um, or a form of production or an institution. I think we would probably, uh, like a, an institutional structure, that's probably the way we would describe it today, um, that, that subordinates, that, that keeps your, your production uh, and your work from actually engaging, um, from actually being part of the class struggle. So this is, in some ways, institutional critique before institutional critique. So not only being, you know, politically committed in the way you produce your work, in the way you write, or in the way you think, or in the way you you um, you produce something that's visual or experiential, but also knowing the the institutional institutional structures that that uh, hold power over your production, right? Um, so that's the important first step. For this this refunctioning, and that's and that's at the level of, of the author. Um, the second step then is to come up with strategies, uh, not only to to sort of highlight the way in which institutional structures um, and 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 the prevailing modes of production, which are capitalist in in France and in Germany, how they ensnare. Um, um, your production, but also to come up with strategies to, to, to start breaking that down, um, to actually attack this apparatus that's proletarianizing your, your, your work. Um, and so he says very directly, these are strategies to gain control of this means of production in order to materially aid the class struggle. So this is not only about making art or writing in a way that then... Um, um, uh, represents or articulates or theorizes uh, injustice, social inequality, uh, the working class and the class struggle, but it's also understand how that writing and how those works of art are actually impeded by 
uh, capitalist forces and capitalist institutions and then uh, uh, going after those and, and trying to uh, break down those very those very structures and institutions in order then to materially uh, affect the society and, and class uh, class structure. Um, and so for me, this is one moment where I feel like uh, the, the goal is really, you know, the goal is very revolutionary here. Um, it's not only to write about revolution, but to understand which the way in which your writing is produced um, uh, is not revolutionary, um, is actually uh, um, uh, conservative um, or reactionary because it, it's being funneled through, it's being championed by, by the powers that be. So it's not only, you know, writing about the revolution, but, but understanding uh, how your writing is is uh, uh, is produced on a material plane, like you know, like printed and and and, and where you write and, and and so on and so forth, um, how they actually appear in a material sense. It's actually attacking that too. It's revolutionizing that. So the it, the goal is really um, um, high, and I wonder if the strategies that that he discusses and that Breck champions, I wonder if they really meet the level of that ambition. That's something we, we could talk about. Uh, but what, some, what are some of these strategies? Well, like the beginning of the text, these are overcoming these divisions that have been unhelpful and that actually conserve uh, the power structures in society that, that be. So the steadfast distinction between those that produce and those that consume, or the performers on stage and the audience or the spectators, or the writer and, and those that read the writing, um, this will have a great influence on a French philosopher later on, Roland Barthes, who will talk about the death of the, the death of the author, um, and and the distinction between individual and collective. So these are binaries that have really been been encoded and come part of, um, let's call it a, a, a history of of art and writing that would be bourgeois. Um, these are now uh, uh, starting to, to, to break down um, and they're starting to meet um, and they're starting to get synthesized um, in, in Brecht, but also in, in Benjamin. So these strategies have to have, above all, if you're turning consumers into producers or the audience into performers or readers into writers or, the, or, or um, um, understanding the collective uh, to be to be a set of individuals, uh, what you're, what Benjamin is describing here is a writer or an artist that's organizing. There's an organizing function. He calls it an organizing function to the work, and that's the crucial part. I think the idea of organizing function and literary tendency from the beginning of his argument they work together. They might in some ways be synonymous, and this is where the materialist aspect of his argument really resides, right? Because if art now is materially engaging the public, it's not just reflecting, it's actually changing. It's actually forming and coloring the way the, the social and political landscaping landscape is unfolding. Um, so let's look at just a, a, couple, a couple examples. Uh, the first is actually from well after 1970, because again, I'd mentioned institutional critique a few moments ago, and it does seem like that first step in umfunctionierung, uh, refunctioning or recasting or functional transformation, is very close to what institutional critique will be in the in the in the late 60s and, and 1970s and onward. Um, because if you've studied this history, you'll know that someone like Hans Hacke, his work was not only political, um, and in this case, in the case of the MoMA poll from 1970, it was socially engaged and participatory because the public were invited to vote. Um, so it was not only participatory, but it was also directing and pointing and calling attention to the institution itself, in this case MoMA, but not only MoMA, but MoMA's complicity or, um, or, or MoMA's position within the broader politics of the time. Um, and so you'll be able to read from the, from the wall there, it was very simple, it was a question you know, would the fact that Governor Rockefeller, that he hasn't denounced Nixon in, in uh, Indochina, Vietnam, would that be a reason for you not to vote for him in November? So you have uh, uh, on the left box, yes, and then on the right box, no. So it's really politically engaged, very clearly, 
um, in, in, one, in maybe the central political issue of the time in 1970, Vietnam. But everyone would know that the Rockefellers are, were incredibly important for, still are, were important for MoMA and funding. He was the, direct, he was on the director on the board at the time. And so this, would, this work would call attention to the institution that it was in. Right? So that's the premise of institutional critique. Well, isn't that exactly what, what uh, Brecht and Benjamin are describing when they say that art, artists and writers should acknowledge their own proletarianization with, with respect to their modes of production, with respect to the institutions and the exhibition spaces and the venues that make their work appear, right? So that's a pretty concrete example of this, this refunctioning. Another example which would be more contemporary with Benjamin's essay, and Benjamin definitely champions this artist, would be the photomontagist uh, John Hartfield. Uh, and so montage is a, is a, montage is, is a form of, of creativity, a form of, of, of producing work that's very much within the scope of refunctioning that Brecht and Benjamin talk about. Um, and I think it's related to, when we get to the situation in international, I think it's related to this idea of détournement which you'll know more about later, which is the idea of taking pre-existing material and then altering them um, and, and using their meanings often against themselves, um, literally refunctioning, really recasting or repurposing um, the, 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 the medium that, that you've taken. And so Hartfield's photomontage, there are any number of them that I could give you as an example, will take images from the press and then subvert them. Um, and make certain comments. Like, uh, Hartfield's wonderful for like uh, exposing sort of the obscene underbelly of what's actually going on through his imagery. Um, and they're always very scathing and very ironic. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a great case in point. The meaning of the Hitler salute, little man asks for big gifts. So you have uh, this sort of diminu diminutive Hitler in the front saluting, but actually, the salute is really him just taking money from the capitalist class, which were the, the you know the financiers of the National Socialists, and ultimately of of um, of the political scene in uh, in Germany, along with the Nazis, and all, all of it ultimately financing the World War II that's to come. Um, so montage is a way of refunctioning, which again, it's not simply a form of represent, re representation, it's actually intervening in the modes of production, in this case, images in the press, right? So it's more materially engaged. Another example that's really important for Benjamin, as you might Im imagine, because the, uh, Brecht is the, is the, is the artist um, who, who is most known for um, refunctioning and functional transformation, is Brecht himself and the epic theater. Um, so the Epic Theater, uh, it's one of those first theaters that, that really tried to um, break the fourth wall between the audience and, uh, and the performance, and the performers. Um, Brecht called this moments of alienation. So not alienation in actually the classic Marxist sense where we feel alienated in society, um, um, but alienated in the sense of alienated from the plot alienated from being lulled into spectacle, being lulled into a story and just being a passive observer. Um, there are moments in his plays which were usually rather, like really rather austere, where the plot would get interrupted um, and the audience would be, in, would, would be compelled to stop and, and think, um, and think for themselves. So there's, there's a way in which epic theater tried to engage uh, and not, not create passive viewers, but create active active thinkers. Um, so the, the epic theater, in both its form and its content, was um, was uh, was had the, the what what Benjamin described as the correct political uh, tendency, which was which was then also the, the same thing as the literary tendency. Right. This is where we get to the synthesis of form and content, of style and production. Of of um, of image or performer, and um, and 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 the, the material uh, existence of society in this case the public, um, all these things are are fused. And again, it it, it all goes into the service 
of organization, of organizing, of interrupting traditional media in order to activate and organize a public. Again, for Benjamin, the, the, the progressive literary tendency is the one that engages the public towards leftist politics, towards um, the proletariat, and towards the class, uh, the class struggle. So in his examples in this, in this essay, we have Tetriakov, we have Brecht's epic theater, we have montage. Um, they're all examples of this synthesis between tendency and quality. Um, they're all examples of literary, literary tendency and technique, wherein the, 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 the form um, and the way in sort of the aesthetic dimension of the work is one and the same with, um, um, with the material conditions of its, of its appearance. Um, so that you know, Benjamin thinks that he's he's gone past this division between tendency and quality that we talked at the beginning, um, in order to, to create a truly dialectically materialist um, um, form of art or or form of, of 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 writing. And so I hope this all makes Benjamin's idea and theorization of artist as producer clearer. Um, and I think we can conclude by just circling back a bit and talking about this in relation to participatory practices in, in the, the, the bigger picture. So not only those that we're going to talk about uh, when we meet um, uh, Dada, Russian avant-garde, and futurism, but also since, you know, the participatory in, in the broadest sense. Because the reason, one of the reasons why Benjamin's essay has been so read and reread and is so important for this type of work is that it it, it, it taps into and it, it, it articulates things that still that still resonate um, that should still resonate with us in many ways so I think uh, you know I'll just ask the, these questions because these will be helpful for, for, for when we meet and we'll, we'll talk about the ways in which his essay not only hooks up to the historic avant-garde but maybe some of the questions that we're going to be dealing throughout the semester and so the first, the obvious one is the question of political commitment versus formal qualities. Um, this is still, I think you could you could tell from our reading of Claire Bishop's antagonism and relational aesthetics that this was a driving question in her text. Um, the, the the sort of the friction or the the losing sight of formal qualities for social uh, engagement or political commitment. Like how do we have these two together? How do we get past the, the, the friction or the, the, the purported division between these two um, is still a question that we that, that we can mull mull over and think about today and then also just specific to this text is after reading the author as producer and one probably has to do it a number of times to really be able to, to give a definitive opinion um, does one think that Benjamin really has provided a way out um, um, through his through his synthesis of tendency and quality the other question is the question of autonomy and heteronomy, which I, I, I broached when, we were, when I mentioned Plato at the beginning. So should the artist be completely free to rove? Um, should an artist be uh, free from the conditions or from the coercions to, to be socially engaged or to be, to be political? Um, to, 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 to sort of exist and create within a, an, aesthetic, an aesthetic sphere, an aesthetic impulse that isn't determined by the social political, or is an artist should an artist be heter uh, um, within within a do domain of heteronomy, um, which is the division between autonomy and heteronomy comes from Rancière, which we'll end up talking about later, I'm sure. Uh, but heteronomy simply means that the artist is 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 not separate from the social and political. And I think we could tell reading author's producer Benjamin is championing uh, an, an an artist that. Uh, uh, is within heteronomy. Um, an artist is, is, in, is in many ways subservient and coerced to make works of tendency and quality that uh, contribute to the class to the class struggle. So this is a, this is a, this is going to be another key question for us all semester all semester long. The question the 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 division or the tensions between autonomy and heteronomy. Another question I think which is really fascinating 
and we're going to, I'm sure it's going to come up more than once, are questions having to, to do with humanitarianism and philanthropic aid, or his, his, his critique of activism, um, the group, capital A, the group activism in, in, in Germany at the time, of being beside poverty and struggle. Um, and here we can call to Hal Foster's artist, uh, um, artist as an eth ethnographer, um, where he talks, he, he begins with Van Yoon's essay, and he talks about the way in which some artists have, uh, have a, a, um, a proclivity to go into a community, do something, and then leave it, right? Almost as this, almost as this benefactor. Um, or to think of artists as sort of like social aid workers or humanitarian workers that go somewhere, make a work that's, that, that, that helps the situation and then, and then leaves. Um, is, that, is that enough? Um, is that really engaged with um, the, the, the broader political and social questions having to do with inequality and, and struggle and so on and so forth? Um, that's another key question for us. Um, um, or is there a way in which artists can go, can go further? And then lastly, the one that I think maybe is the most pressing and the one that really echoes our current moment um, is the idea of state and corporate co-option of social justice movements, um, which usually falls into the, the domain of, of being opportunistic or instrumentalizing, right? This is really prescient on Benjamin's part, I think. Uh, he says right there on page 774, the bourgeois apparatus of production and publication can assimilate astonishing quantities of re revolutionary themes, indeed can propagate them without calling its own existence and the existence of the class that, it's, that, it own, that owns it seriously into question. This is scathing. Um, and I think we could, we could come up with a number of examples today where um, either state and cover, the government or corporate um, you know companies have taken on the mantle or the key words or um, or, or sometimes just in a performative way um, the stakes of social justice I'm thinking maybe a black lives matter um, but but also we, we it can be across the board it can be feminism it can be LGBTQ rights it can be all, a number of things where they've, they've taken these um, and, and they seem to be champions of it, but at the material level, which is the level that <clears throat> Benjamin is most interested in, it's not doing anything, right? So like, I don't know, a, a Nike um, <clears throat> getting behind Colin Kaepernick, right? This, is, this was a big thing. And it seems to be a wonderful uh, anti-racist stance. Uh, but in what way did it actually change the, the, the labor and material conditions of Nike as a corporation, um, as, 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 a, as a mode of production? It probably didn't change anything, right? You still have the sweatshops, you still have um, outsourced labor, racialized outsourced labor in Indonesia and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and so at the level of discourse, it was really wonderful. But then at the level of, of, of the actual material struggle of uh, of of, of labor and injustice, and in our, today's terms, it would be global, right? Not It wasn't yet global with Benjamin, but it's global for us. Um, what he says is it may, may fit this to a T, where it, 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 they, uh, it's propagated, but it doesn't actually call into existence, um, and it's, it's, it's set um, uh, conditions which are uh, um, reinforced by an elite financial class um, that doesn't come into question. Right. So, so I feel like this passage on page 774 is really interesting, really prescient, and something we might, we might well think through. And I leave you with, as I will for, every, um, for almost every, every video lecture that I give you, the text consulted. So if you want to, to read more about anything, uh, you, know, you just pause and jot down the source that, that seems appealing to you.